You may remember uh, a few bears ago, uh, we were very proud of Parlab, which was another nationwide competition that uh, Berkeley won, and we were proud of that. And of course, part of the unusual nature of research in EECS at Berkeley is we start exciting projects that have huge results, and then we bring them to an end freeing up constellations of faculty to take ideas that grew in those projects and launch them into the, the next wave. Uh, so uh, Aspire is one example of that. It, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the parallel programming problem that Parlab was so focused on was hard enough that you really had to develop very deep technology to synthesize solutions. Uh, and some of that technology uh, we're gonna see now taking, coming to the fore in Aspire. Let me say a word or two about uh, Kirsta himself. Uh, Kirsta uh, was in fact a graduate student here and one of our, our star graduate students years ago and uh, we believe that our very best need to go out into the world so we allowed him to spend a few years at MIT where he continued to conquer the world and uh, joined us uh, at the beginning of our lab about five years ago and uh, so of course we're, we're thrilled to have him back and uh, being also an alum, it's a great thing about uh, going to the East Coast, you can move back to California and not feel guilty about it. So welcome, Kirsten. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you about Aspire. Um, as David mentioned, this is uh, building on a lot of the work we did earlier in Parlab, though there is a, uh, we like to mix things up, so there are a few new faculty coming in and out of this next project um, listed here. So this is the only org shot I will show you, is that we all work together. That's a list of faculty right there. So. What are we looking at? Well, if we look at future, as Edward pointed out, there's all these amazing new applications out there that people are imagining are gonna come along in the next 10 to 15 years. So everything from augmented reality, having these tiny glasses, watching the whole world around you, overlaying information on there, um, personal robotics, having a robot that looks at your laundry and folds it for you, um, uh, speech everywhere, so these agents, you can just talk to them and things will happen. Um, ready social networks are exploding. I think nearly everybody on the planet is on Facebook. Um, and companies are looking to mine that information there. And so what you're seeing is a lot of data being gathered from swarm-like devices around the world, from the environment being used to control, monitor the environment. This is all being funneled into these huge data centers that are crunching all this data um, and doing things, incredible things like maybe looking at personalized medicine, looking at your gene sequence and figuring out what is the right treatment for you as an individual versus a big aggregate. So there's this great vision of all these applications we want to do. The one common thing they have is they all require a lot of compute like huge amounts of computation. And Aspire is really about how we're gonna get that computation. And the big limiter across this whole space, from these mobile devices, out the environment, to the big data centers is energy. How are we gonna power this compute that we need? I like to frame this problem in terms of this compute energy iron law. So if you have some performance you wanna achieve, some power that's available, you're constrained by this energy iron law, by your energy efficiency. So performance in tasks per second, is given by the power you have available, either to supply or cool, joules per second, that's watts. Multiply that by energy efficiency, how many tasks you do per joule. This is like your car, your miles per gallon, how efficient is your computer? And this fundamentally constrains what's possible with future computers. So if your power is constrained, um, then you're gonna need better energy efficiency for more performance, right? Power is fixed, the only thing I can do is improve energy efficiency if I want more performance. If I'm in a real-time application where I know my performance constraint, then the only way I'm gonna reduce power again is by improving uh, energy efficiency. So really, energy efficiency, which is the E in Aspire, is the, the main goal for all future systems of work. It's really the critical limiter to that, that bright future we see predicted. Now let's take a look at what technology is doing. Um, well, the good news is Moore's Law is not quite dead yet. Um, where Moore's law is what Gordon Moore originally said, which is that the number of components we can put on a chip is growing over time. Um, and he was uh, uncannily accurate, and maybe it was a self-fulfilling prophecy about how many transistors we'll have over a chip over time, increasing, doubling every few 18 months to two years. And, but I think actually the main important feature of Moore's law is not that we get more transistors per chip, but that they become cheaper. And he pointed out this out in his original paper. And it's this reduction in cost that's allowed computers to, 
just um, profused throughout the environment and all these weird applications, right? All these amazing things people are doing is only possible because computers got so cheap. Um, now, he had predicted this back in his original paper, and he imagined this little stand, but what, what if every home had its own computer? Now, of course, you look, and individuals have hundreds of computers. All of you probably own several hundred processors and various devices. So this is great, and this is continuing. It may be slowing down a little in terms of number of components and cost per transistor. This is the good news. The bad news is voltage scaling is over. So what happened in technology was when CMOS technology, the basis of all the devices we use, when that first came out, power supply was five volts. Why was it five volts? Because TTL, the preceding technology, was five volts. After a while, CMOS scaled down in feature size. That's the x-axis here, getting finer and finer pitched. And uh, Bob Dennard at IBM showed that if you scaled voltage with feature size, you had all these nice properties come together. You know, this very nice regime of Dennard scaling where supply voltage would come down, energy uh, per operation would go down. You can maintain a reasonable power density for a chip during this period by following this curve, by follow, scaling the supply voltage down as you scale transistors down. What you might notice is this has flattened out in recent technology generations. We're stuck at around one volt for the power supply. So we're now in this post Dennard uh, regime where we're not scaling supply voltage down. So why did we stop? Well, the reason is we have to scale all the voltages to keep all the electric fields constant as dimensions shrink. However, the threshold voltage, which is the, the voltage at which the transistor turns on, it has an exponential relationship with leakage. So as we reduce that threshold voltage, we suddenly, leakage, which is something we didn't worry about before, the transistor is on even though it's supposed to be off, became an important factor. So you look at the trend, this is from Gordon Moore's keynote ISIS, you see leakage power suddenly became a big, big, big component of total system power. And this has prevented us from dropping the threshold voltage. Another big factor here is as we scale things down, there's increasing variability. So it's hard to control that threshold voltage and small changes around something with an exponential is very dangerous. So people have to provide sufficient margin and so the power supply stayed up at around one volt for quite a few years. So we're no longer in this nice regime of uh, Denard scaling. So what does this cause us to do? Well, we can't, um, go down this path and expect reasonable power density. The end of Denard scaling means power density is gonna rise if we just uh, go on as before. And that's what we saw. So this was the first big impact. This was the shift to parallelism was brought about by this end of the scaling. So we went from you know, just cranking away on a single core trying to raise this clock rate until the power density became too high. And you see this towards the end. Now we had to back off and instead, what we're doing is placing multiple cores, and this is all the way through the industry from smartphones to uh, server chips, all using multi-core technology now to improve performance because we cannot crank up the clock rate at a reasonable power density for a single core. This was our original inspiration for PowerLab. This is happening. How are we gonna program these chips? We know how to build them, but we don't know how to uh, program them easily, or at least the mass majority of programmers don't know how to program them. How do we make this technology available to the masses? So we did all this work on parallelism in PowerLab, and that was great. We had a lot of fun. We made a lot of progress, we think, and that's building blocks for Aspire. However, parallelism was really only a one-time game, like a one-trick pony. What we did was use more slower cores to get an energy efficiency gain. And there were really two ways we made slower cores. One was just simpler cores. We had gone up this complexity curve trying to get more single-thread performance. By backing off a little and using simpler cores, we cut the energy per instruction, and by using more cores in aggregate, we could get back the performance at better energy efficiency. So that was the first trick with simpler cores. The second trick was to run the cores we had at lower VDD and at a different operating point, lower frequency, lower VDD, energy's proportional to the square of the voltage, so we could drop the VDD, get better energy efficiency, and again, use more cores together to get the performance we needed. Now, we can't keep doing this, um, because there's a limit to how simple you can make a core before it stops being a core, right? There's a limit to how simple you can make a core. Also, as we just talked about, with threshold voltage being a constraint, there's a limit to how much we can drop the supply voltage and have a reasonable trade-off between performance and energy. So we're really constrained. And so the big question now is really, you know, now what? Now what do we do? Okay, parallelism was great. It took a lot of pain. It gave us these benefits. We're still, it's still working its way through the industry. Uh, what's the next thing? Well, the next thing is we're already seeing is a second big impact of uh, the end of scaling. And that's this phrase you hear a lot in the industry, dark silicon. Uh, so what is dark silicon? Well, this term was coined by, coined by uh, Mike Muller, the ARM CTO, uh, in this presentation. And what he's pointing out is because we're in this post Denard era, we cannot switch all the transistors we build on a chip at full frequency. It will just blow the power budget we have. 
So that's no longer possible. And he illustrated this with an example. If you had a design in 45 nanometer occupied a whole chip with a certain power budget, as you scale through technology, you get some benefit in clock frequency, some benefit in energy, but overall, to achieve the same power, you're going to have to power up a much smaller fraction of the chip. So we're going down 11 nanometer, only 10% of that die can be active if you want to stay within your power constraint. So you're having all these extra transistors. Moore's law is giving you more transistors. But Denard's law, uh, standard Denard scaling means you cannot actually power them up at full frequency, switch them up full frequency. This is a very scary concept to many people. What are we going to do now? And it, behind this is the other realization, well, I'm not going to get much more performance if I'm using a smaller fraction of my chip with every technology generation. I'm not going to get that compute performance I need for these applications. I can maybe make them cheaper, but I'm not going to get the performance I need. So what people realize, well, what we can do is maybe use Moore's law, uh, the advantage there, to provide more specialized accelerators. So use those transistors, don't have the same thing everywhere, but have different accelerators and only use that piece of the chip that's needed for this part of the application at this point in time. So build more specialized processors. So that's really the next um, thing we have to look at. But the thing to not realize here is that there is no real savior device technology on the horizon. There's no great new device. As CMOS was waiting in the wings when TTL and ECL died out, there's nothing really there ready for a little while to replace this. So any improvements we're going to get must be above the transistor level, right? And so what people are doing is building um, specialized engines. So is really this the end of general purpose processes? You already see this in, say, a smartphone system on a chip where there's somewhere in the middle there, there are some general purpose processes, the big Cortex A9 ARM CPUs, but most of the die is covered in these specialized accelerators for graphics, for video encode, for video decode, for image signal processing, for audio processing. And these are customized blocks designed to just do one piece of the application well, right? And the hope is that you don't actually try and do everything all at once. There'll be a few of those functions you'll turn on at a time. And so really dark silicon is ready here, here with us right now. Um, but this approach, the point is these accelerators only cover a small piece of the whole application space. How are we going to help the hundreds of thousands of applications in the App Store, for example? How are they going to run better? Most of these are very fixed function devices. Another challenge industry faces is developing these things is incredibly complicated. You have many different kinds of processor on this die. So it's huge hardware development costs as well as the software development costs that map onto this hardware. But all this is really a distraction from the real problem. So this is all talking about processors. The real problem these days is communication. So as transistors become smaller and cheaper, we build, put more of them together into larger and larger systems. The individual compute units shrink and shrink and shrink. And what dominates is the communication uh, between these. So over time, we get more and more components, same size system, more and more components. Communications cost grows dramatically relative to the cost of computation. So really instead of focusing on the specialized processing, we should be worrying much more about the communication costs inside these systems. And this is true at all scales, whether it's across a chip, up and down a memory hierarchy on a node, uh, chip to chip on a board, board to board in a system, rack to rack in a data center. Communication really dominates both the performance and the energy, and this is what we really have to focus on. So leading to Aspire, so Spire is really a project that's trying to attack this problem above the transistor level. We have to optimize the whole stack from application down to hardware, and we need to specialize and optimize communication as well as computation across this whole stack in order to, to make these applications we like to see become reality. Now at Berkeley, we don't just like to do better than the other guys. We want to do the best possible. So really, part of Aspire is from better to best. So what's the best we can do is a question we set out to ask ourselves. So say, pick a target technology, say seven nanometer. What's the best system you can build in that? In that? How would we know? Well, first thing we should do is, you know, can we prove a bound? What's the best possible in this technology, right? That's the first step. Um, next step is can we actually design an implementation that approaches that bound? That would be the next step. Uh, and if we manage to do this, then we get to provably optimal implementations. So this is really at the heart of the Aspire project. That's the PI, provably optimal implementations. Can we actually get to the point where designing optimal implementations in a target technology? Not, not just better than other designs, but provably optimal. So how are we going to do this? Well, this, this is built on an idea that emerged in Parlab um, from Jim Demel's group. And that's the idea of communication avoiding algorithms. So that's the A in Aspire. Um, previously, when people designed algorithms, they focused on the compute that was done in the algorithms. How many flops does it do? And they would come up with lower bounds in terms of the number of floating point operations needed to do a matrix multiply, for example. 
Okay. But talking to the architects, Jim realized, well, actually the problem is all this communication, and also his experience in programming in real machines. It's always moving data around, up and down the memory hierarchy across the cluster. That's really the constraint. So why not recast the problem, and how do you design algorithms that minimize the words of data moved uh, for, to do the computation? So that's the idea behind communication avoiding algorithms. So as I said, it's both up and down a memory hierarchy on one node or between nodes in a parallel system. So those are the two cases to consider. So I'll just give you a flavor of the kind of work Jim does. Um, so just to consider um, performance to start with, he builds a model of a machine that says, well, the time to run a computation will be some amount of time for each floating point operation or other operation you do, plus some amount of time to move a message around that machine, plus depending on how long that message is, the number of words in a message. So this gives you the runtime model. He then proves that for a given computation, any algorithm, any algorithm, has to do at least this much communication, right? So any algorithm with this machine model has to do at least this much communication. That's a lower bound. Now the incredible thing is his group then go on and invent algorithms that attain that lower bound. And what's more exciting is when they actually run them on real machines, they get dramatic speed ups by doing this. So here's just a few examples of the incredible list of speed ups and papers Jim's group have produced using this approach. So the top one I'll just highlight, which is on a very large multiprocessor, a 64,000 core blue gene, uh, they got 12 times faster um, on a matrix multiply code um, basically by doing 20 times less communication than the previously tuned code for that machine. Now this is incredible to me because you would think that matrix multiply is something that people have beaten to death over the last 30, 40 years. There's probably hundreds of PhD theses on doing this. So this is a dramatic improvement by rethinking the problem in terms of communication, not computation. And Jim's gone on in this group to look at many, many other kinds of computation and achieve similar impressive results. In Aspire, we're moving, moving this work forward to not just look at the runtime, but also look at energy. So now we're modeling the energy of your system while it's running an application. So there's a few components to energy. One is the dynamic energy. This, this matches the performance uh, parameters in terms of how much compute do you do, how much data do you move around the machine. So this is dynamic energy to do a computation, but we all know that dynamic energy is only one part of the equation in a system. You have to worry about static energy. Now one of the tricks they do in these communication avoiding algorithms is replicate data everywhere. So we have to account for the cost of retaining data in memory. So the background power of just holding bits. So that's the second term we have up here. It's delta E. So for given capacity memory over a period of time, you have to pay energy to hold that uh, data constant in there. And the final is just background power. All these systems have leakage. All these things you're not accounting for run in the background. So how, depending how long your computation is, you have to account for the energy of keeping all that stuff powered up while you're doing the computation. Now using these simple models, again, Jim's group has been able to prove lower bounds on any algorithm to perform a, com uh, a certain computation. What's the lower bound of the energy you're gonna need to run that, given these technology parameters? And so he's done this for a range of uh, different algorithms. And I'll just point out one interesting recent result they've had, which is that um, with one of their communication optimal algorithms, they can achieve what we call uh, energy strong scaling in time and energy. So the idea is you start with a computation um, that fits in some number of processors with some amount of memory per processor. Say you have the minimum amount of memory across the system to hold your problem initially. Now you start adding processors, each with additional memory, and I'm gonna use all that memory by replicating data using this algorithm. Um, then what you find is that um, if I increase the number of processes by a factor of C, I can improve the runtime. Just look at the blue terms. Um, the time to run on C processors is the time to run on one processor divided by C. So they get linear speed up, which is good. But more interestingly, when they look at the energy, they can also show that the energy for C processors is the same as the energy for the original set of processors. So faster with the same energy cost. This is quite an interesting result. Energy strong scaling, they can prove this. Okay, um, and they're looking at more algorithms other than just um, uh, scientific kind of computing. Um, so we're applying these to other application areas. This is part of Aspire. Take this technology and try and use it much more widely. So recently we've been looking at database uh, operations, for example, like join algorithms and applying the same idea there. Okay, so how are we gonna get from these communication avoiding algorithms to provably optimal systems? Well, um, our first step is do what Jim's been doing, prove the lower bounds of communication. Um, then build an algorithm that hits those lower bounds. These are just you know, what we need to do. Um, if we then build, if we then build the system and measure it and find out that communication time and energy is dominating, say it's 90%, then we know we're done, right? There's nothing more, we, we've, we've shown the lower bound and then we found in our implementation, this piece that we have a lower bound on is dominating. 
So we know we're within 10 percent of optimal at this point. So this is how we're going to get to prove the optimal. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of details I'm hiding behind the covers here. One thing is we have to optimize everything else to expose fundamental communication as the bottleneck. Optimize away any efficiencies in the software stack or the processors to get to this uh, lower bound. Okay, so that's talking about the algorithm piece, a very important piece of Aspire. I want to dive down in Parlab, we're really focused on the software stack because we had, we knew how to build the hardware, but we need, had to figure out how to program it. In Aspire, we're looking back at the architecture now. We need to do something. We're not going to get these energy gains without changing the processor architecture. So one of the pieces of this puzzle is we're burning what we call an applications processor for Aspire. If you look at modern chips, systems on a chip, both in servers and in smartphones, they have very similar structures. There is a what we call an application processor, which is a general purpose programmable multi-core. It's what most developers program when they're programming one of these SOCs. So everybody developing apps in the app store, they're programming the ARMs in a smartphone, right? But also these are surrounded by a bunch of specialized engines uh, that only do a specific task. But what we want to try and do in Aspire is try and get some of that specialization efficiency for every kind of code, for general purpose tasks. Can we pull in for specialized engines and make them available to application programmers for all tasks. This is challenging. As an architect, you always face this problem. You're designing processes for applications you haven't seen yet. You don't even know what they're going to be. How do you do well at that? This is a big challenge. Okay, so this is our ESP uh, idea. So replace the application processor with this ESP. And ESP stands for an ensemble of specialized processors. So our idea here is, well, if you look at general purpose processors, they're very flexible, but they're inefficient. Look at fixed function hardware. It's very efficient, but it's inflexible. So how are we going to bridge this gap? Our idea builds on a Parlab insight. As we did Parlab, we realized that most, all the computations we looked at, all the algorithms could be broken down into certain patterns of communication and computation. So instead of having an arbitrary collection of accelerators and blocks, let's focus on these patterns which we view as really the, the periodic table of computation. These are the things that recur repeatedly across many, many application domains. So when building this new style of general purpose architecture, we want to optimize each accelerator or engine type within this engine for a particular pattern and hope this is widely used, and we believe it's going to be widely used across all different kinds of application domains. Um, so this is our general idea of the SP, an ensemble of the idea is each one individually is very good at only a single pattern of communication and computation, but collectively they'll cover the whole space. So the hope is to get generality uh, plus efficiency in the CSP design. Okay. So, so in Parlab, just to sort of quickly uh, review what we did in Parlab, we realized that when we looked at all these parallel applications, we could break them down into these recurring motifs or patterns, things like dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, graph traversal. These things showed up time and time again. We did large application studies, and this is a heat map showing you for all of our different, uh, what we call these dwarfs or motifs, how they appeared in different application areas, right? So you see that some, in, e in each application area, some things show up a lot, some things not at all, and the mix changes as you look at different applications. So inside an ESP, let's build engines for each one of these, and we'll turn them on and off as we need for each of those application areas. Now, how are you going to program this thing? Fortunately, this seems like a beast. You have all these different engines. How's the program going to view these? Fortunately, when we, working through the Parlab stack, we figured out what we really need to do is raise the abstraction level to a very high level, let programmers think in terms of these patterns, and then build automatic transformation tools that take that high level code down to implementations. Um, and so we're going to use the same strategy. Without changing the code, we hope we can insert this new specialized engine underneath. We can go from these, each of these patterns, and now our ESP core has a standard core in the middle plus these engines designed for a particular pattern. And we just build specializers that take those high level patterns that the user has done at a very high level. We actually use Python as our program at that level and map it down very efficiently into code for this platform at the bottom. And this asset infrastructure, at Berkeley we like to produce things open source. You can go download our specializer infrastructure that helps you write these kinds of specializers in Python. It's available for download. Another piece of the puzzle, these fixed accelerators. These are a challenge to design and program. And what we're trying to look at is can we also do something here? We're replacing this fixed function engines with some kind of programmable fabric. This is another thing we're looking at in Aspire, ready to reduce the cost of deploying new algorithms in, the, in this space. Um, so this is very early days. We have a lot of ideas about this. One of our key ideas really is building on pilot. Let's program at a very high level. We're not going to have a C compiler for this array. You don't want to even think about it. If you're thinking about C compilers, you're thinking about the wrong thing. You have to program using parallel programming at a very high level, and we're going to map this automatically down to this array. We also want to iterate on our design space. So one of the things we're doing is going all the way down through the hardware, looking at different processor designs. And um, 
one thing we've been pushing here at Berkeley, I have a small team that does a lot of chips, and we have to do them quickly, so we had to become agile by, you know, there's only way we could survive. So we're trying to push this idea of an agile harder develop methodology. So, you know, every couple weeks, have a version of your chip you could fabricate, and over time, incrementally add to it. Now, so those of you who do chip design realize it's pretty difficult. We're going all the way down through to clean GDS every few weeks and then adding a few features rather than setting up the feature list ahead of time then battling for months and months and months to try and make it fit. Just iteratively iterate and this helps us in our research too. We can try out new ideas and uh, um, and one of the, the technologies we have from Parlab that's helping us with this, we developed our own hardware description language, Chisel, um, to replace Verilog that we used before. And we basically embedded the HDL inside the Scala programming language. This is a modern pro -like programming language, lots of facilities, nice facilities like functional programming, object oriented programming, lets us build very powerful hardware generators um, and from this one description, we can generate layout or <coughs> FPGA emulations for very fast simulation or fast C cycle simulations. And it's actually a lot more than just the hardware description language. We've been extending it above with domain specific languages that we might use to program that fabric we talked about. I mean, extending it below, there's even a group looking at quantum computing based on this. And there's available open source of this website if you want to go down, load our chisel hardware description language. A small group of us, we've been building um, a lot of chips with this. This the last few years, a bunch of chips. I can't really talk about these yet. I don't have time and the students need to publish papers, so I can't talk about these. But a lot of, using this agile, we're trying to eat our own dog food here, trying to use this methodology in-house. So the final piece of the puzzle I just want to put up is down at the circuit level, as transistors have shrunk down, uh, we hit with variability in the process manufacturing and also we have to deal with noise at these low voltages. And so we've been trying to build resilient circuits and kind of model what's the best kind of block we can build at, a, at an operating point for a given uh, level of faults, what's the lowest energy the circuit we can build for logic, memory, and interconnect. Um, and some of the things we've been finding, for example, is you know, if you go to RAM technology, a lot of people have been focusing on lowering the voltage to the RAM. But what we realized is you can lower the voltage, but only at the cost of increasing the energy, which is kind of defeating the purpose. So the error correction you need to run at lower voltages doesn't pay off. This is the kind of work we're doing right at the bottom of the stack. Okay, so I'll just summarize by throwing up the whole picture of Aspire. So Aspire is algorithms and specializes for provably optimal implementations with resiliency and efficiency. So our overall goal is we start with applications, we're application driven. What are the applications need? We break them down into computational and structural patterns. That's how we architect the code at a very high level. We then um, automatically, oh, but then we use communication avoiding algorithms within each of those patterns to reduce the communication costs. We then have our um, heterogeneous uh, specialized architectures at the bottom. We're going to translate directly from the patterns called out by the program at a high level into code for our engines. And then another part of the project is evaluating our design. So we push through, generate the hardware, go all the way through the layout, emulate it, and close this loop so we can do deep hardware software design space exploration. So we can figure out the good, good designs to, to look at uh, across the whole stack. So this is kind of an over top to bottom view of the whole project, the people involved. Um, okay, just to say, so the project has started. Final slide. Um, we have initial funding from DARPA from the Perfect Program uh, to get this project off the ground. Um, but we're also interest, very interested in industrial affiliates uh, working with us on um, more commercial uh, uses of this technology. So please come see me. Uh, there's an open house at the Floral Soda today. Happy to take questions. I'm going to pull Kirst over here so we can uh, take questions while we fill in the slides for the next speaker. We have, I think, time for for one or two? There we have another one. So if I caught it correctly, the, the, the overview that you gave at the end sounds kind of similar to the, the PAR Lab approach kind of continuing on. Can you give any differentiation between what PAR Lab was trying to achieve and what you're doing here? Yeah, I, I think one big thing is uh, in Parlab we assumed that parallel multicores were there already and we just had to figure out how to program them. Now we feel like we made a lot of progress in the software stack and now looking ahead we have to improve the hardware now to get more efficiency. So it's using more specialized engines in the hardware but we believe the programming methodology we came up with in Parlab is going to allow us to do that well. So hide a lot of this from most programmers but actually insert these specialized engines underneath. more question there.
Thank you. Uh, great project and great challenges, but uh, I'm a little bit wondering the scalability of your researches. Uh, I guess you need lots of smart people in your group. How do you <laughs> uh, recruit those people? Do you have any idea? Uh, thankfully, we do have lots of smart people in the project. <laughs> Incredible cast of faculty and grad students. So, um, yeah, we're at Berkeley, so <laughs> that, that's our solution. <laughs> okay, thank you, Krista.